note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly via the Council's website, including transferring outside of Australia. In addition to our normal live video feed, tonight um, we are again streaming live to Facebook. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present with us. Item two, uh, I have an apology from Councillor Kira um, and just a note that the Lord Mayor will be coming in uh, a little bit later. Item three, confirmation of the minutes. Can I have someone move the minutes from Kuranaka record? Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. And seconded Councillor Sims, I think. Yes. Oh, oh really have it. <laughs> Here we go. I'm just scratching my face. So I won't go. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Any any discussion on the minutes? I put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Moving on to discussion forum items. 4.1, a presentation from the Adelaide Festival on their 2020 program. I'd like to welcome Rachel Healy, the Joint Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival, and Neil Armfield, AO Joint Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival. Please come forward. And just a reminder, we've got 10 minutes um, uh, for this presentation after. <laughs> Thank you, councillors. Very nice to be here. Uh, we're really delighted to, uh, to be here to uh, share a bit about our 2020 program. Can we just press your microphone button? Oh, sure. There we go. And I think I have to go back. Is that right? <coughs> To kick off, we just want to show you a five, small five-minute film. We know it's going to take up half our speaking time, which we've specially created to celebrate 60 years of the Adelaide Festival. And it's going to be shown in, uh, in the park on our opening night, just prior to our free concert with Tim Minchin. Um, it's a little sneak preview. No one else has seen this film. It's hot off the press. And it's actually, there are a couple of um, uh, things that are just temporarily holding their place. We're, we're waiting to get some footage from the ABC. Hang on. I'm gonna, am I doing this thing correctly? It doesn't seem to be on. Oh, I'd love that. You need to go, uh, to go back a couple. Yeah, perfect. Here it is. It doesn't seem to be. Oh, I'm doing the lights with the Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Good. No, that's no good. Take it, go, go black. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> At the opening day of the festival ball year, the whole city goes gay. Such an adventure is the Adelaide Festival of Art. Organizing a festival of art is no joke. <laughs> Thank you. 
sizzle really of um, uh, glimpses of the festivals over the, uh, the 60 years of its existence. That's right. Uh, so uh, we've come back every year just to give you uh, a glimpse of the program but I thought it was important just to uh, I guess help you understand once again that the programming of the festival is not simply a question of Neil and I traveling overseas and choosing works that we like. Uh, there's an entire strategy that is built uh, into the way that we make our decisions. And uh, that's included in our strap plan. And the success of that strategy is what's led to the unprecedented growth trajectory that we're currently on. Every year we announce uh, a record box office, attendance is a great, massive uh, interstate visitation. And underneath that is a series of business decisions that have created the kind of, of trajectory that we're on. Uh, can we have the PowerPoint back? Great. Uh, as, uh, as you know, the kind of uh, national and international press we get, not just for individual shows, but for the festival as a, home, as a whole, is consistently extraordinary. It is still regarded around the globe as one of the must attend festivals of, of the world, uh, alongside Avignon and Edinburgh. You can see, uh, uh, apart from awards, listings and commentary uh, in papers across the globe. Um, uh, you'll recall uh, the alumni that we have, um, this is just a, a, a small number of, uh, of some of the great artists of our generation who have come to the Adelaide Festival every year. Uh, there are extraordinary artists who are absolutely at the top of their game coming to Adelaide. So for people in Adelaide, you don't need to go to London and New York or Japan to see the world's greatest artists. You can stay here in Adelaide. Uh, so the first uh, strategy is that we have a large scale centrepiece event in the first weekend and that becomes the programming anchor for our interstate and overseas audiences. Uh, our partnership with the festival in Aix-en-Provence has meant that we are uh, 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 creating international opera uh, in Adelaide and in Aix that will then tour the world and this year is our first year of our partnership with Aix-en-Provence. Uh, the response around the country to uh, Castellucci's Requiem and the excitement about that has been just thrilling to witness since we, we launched it in, in July. Uh, the second is that, uh, is that we program the great artists of our generation. Uh, what we offer is really different to anything else that happens in Adelaide and I would argue quite different to what's happening uh, anywhere else around Australia when you look at what international arts festivals are here to do. Uh, the Adelaide Festival has always promised its audience the, the, the artists that people are recognising around the, the globe as the game changers. That's our reputation, that's our history, that's certainly our legacy, and that is what's been driving the audience and stakeholder loyalty that we've been enjoying. Uh, 
The third thing is activation of the public domain and supporting creativity in urban environments. This is also, this is a goal that I know that we share with, uh, with the council. And this year, uh, one of the uh, examples of that is fire gardens using the botanic gardens to create an art installation. But the second major project that we are doing in this space is Tatsu Nishi's Dog's House, which will be positioned in Rundle Mall, a free event, it's being installed right now. You may have seen it, it's very big. Yeah, um, and it's about focusing on what's unique about our city and working with artists who are inspired and excited by our particular uh, city, its architecture, its heritage and history. Uh, thought leadership and sharing ideas has always been central to the Adelaide Festival. Here's an image from uh, Writers Week, but as you know, in the last few years, we've also introduced a massively successful Breakfast with Papers program, as well as David Miles Festival Forums. The outcome is about encouraging lifelong learning and, uh, and also promoting diverse perspectives on contemporary society with a range of writers and thought leaders that we invite into, uh, into Adelaide to contribute to community conversations. Uh, Really centrally is events that are exclusive to Adelaide. We drive our, our peers crazy interstate with how fierce we are on that. If the shows that we program are readily available in, in Sydney and Melbourne, then we are not going to drive the interstate traffic that we've been attracting. If we have interstate traffic, then that has an impact on local economic, uh, uh, local economic value, employment, increased visitation. And so we are, uh, uh, as I say, we drive everyone crazy because we are so tough on that issue. We have 18 uh, Adelaide exclusive uh, events uh, this year. That's right. Uh, uh, we are uh, always program Australian and Indigenous work. It is central to what we do. It's part of our charter and we're about sharing our stories and our artists work with audiences. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the support that we've given to companies like Gravity and Other Myths have been game-changing for them. They're now employing 35 acrobats full-time, touring the world. They're doing a nine-month residency in Berlin now. They can't cope with the number of international invitations that they have. And that is, and, and part of our role is to platform those Adelaide success stories and give them uh, a place in the world. Uh, also, commissioning new work. Um, uh, and that provides new opportunities and connections for artists. We're doing four, we've commissioned four female composers this year to be part of our 150 Psalms event. Uh, community engagement is also central to what the Adelaide Festival is and has always been, and that means harnessing uh, participants, volunteers, audiences. You remember uh, the Lost and Found Orchestra from a couple of years ago, Writers Week always, it's always been uh, part of what we do because we recognise the kind of community connectedness it's about reducing social isolation and building cross-generational community cohesion. These aren't just buzzwords, this is absolutely fundamental to what we do. I mean, any of us could go home and watch Richard Dawkins on YouTube tonight and, and, and get those ideas digitally, but we choose to create events where we can be live with each other and experiencing them together. And that's really central to what uh, the Adelaide Festival contributes to our community. Uh, just uh, some very quick stats to show uh, at a glimpse uh, the significant growth in our box office uh, in, uh, and also our fundraising. Our fundraising is both self-generated through donations but also through business sponsorships and our, uh, and our projected growth over the next few years in our strap plan. Um, uh, paid attendances, also really significant growth since 14-15 and projected to continue to grow. Uh, this is uh, our tourism and economic impact uh, so far, impact on the state economy uh, in 19, 23 million and growth every year, 141,000 bed nights. Uh, and I just also want to uh, just give you a picture of our support from the Adelaide City Council, of course. Uh, it is uh, hugely appreciated and valued. I will put in a special plea uh, because our support from council was decreased this year. Uh, we, uh, our core funding, this, this table was created for uh, 2019. Uh, our core funding was cut slightly and WOMAD and fringes uh, was increased slightly. Uh, some of that money came back to us through a special grant for Dolls House. Uh, we do uh, make a plea for, uh, given the kind of work we feel we're doing and the kind of, of uh, support that we have in our community and the work we're doing, we do hope that next time we come back that that, uh, that, that will be rethought. We also really love you to 
uh, consider uh, an ongoing partnership in creating work in the public domain. Uh, obviously, it's too early to say and, or to, to talk about the success or otherwise of Dole's House, but it seems like the kind of project that perfectly aligns with what you're doing and what we want to do. So hopefully more of that. We can see the, the gap between uh, the level of funding in, in Brisbane and Sydney compared with the level of funding uh, as a percentage of overall budget of uh, Adelaide and Melbourne. Uh, that's right. Not that we want to rub anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's probably our five minutes, but I uh, really just wanted to say, unless there's any questions, we really hope we will see you all at the Tim Minchin concert on the 29th of February in Elder Park. It's going to be an absolute blast. We'll start with uh, a beautiful welcome to country, uh, followed by uh, our, little little, film. our little film, and then Tim, and, and finally some fireworks and uh, birthday celebration. Also this year we're producing a, um, a, a 60th uh, birthday uh, book which is a, an anthology really of, uh, of all the festivals uh, written by participants, by audience members, by um, a, a enormous number of stakeholders around, and artists around the, around the country and it's just, been, it's just arrived in the office and it's beautiful. Uh, we're also producing a celebratory 60-year gin, which uh, we're thinking of a gin book package. Yes, <laughs> yes yeah. indeed, it's delicious. Neil chose the botanicals. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Rachel and Neil. I've got a couple of minutes for questions and further feedback. Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Um, firstly, congratulations. And um, yeah, 60 years, that's fantastic and a huge contribution to the city. So thank you. Um, I did have a, a question about this year's program, if I may, and it's an issue that's been raised with me a little bit in light of what's ha been happening at the moment with the uh, catastrophic fires we've seen around the country. Um, I've seen advertising for the fire garden, and I'm just wondering if I can ask a little bit about the programming around that, like when the decision was made to commission them, whether you've had any community feedback around that, um, and also what precautions are being taken to protect wildlife during that time as well. We have had reports of bats being badly impacted by the weather that we've had, and I don't know what the weather's going to be like at that time, but I was a little bit concerned that they may be impacted by open fire. So are you able to talk to some of those issues? It's yeah. important to note that it's, that it's not open fire, that uh, the, it's an installation of 7,000 candles, basically. Okay. Uh, it, was, uh, it was commissioned uh, probably June last year uh, when we when we committed to the, uh, to the company's work. They have been part of WOMAT twice before. Yep. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, really, it's, it's, of course, in the, in the light of, uh, of um, the catastrophic events in Australia over, over recent, um, over, over summer, um, we're being particularly careful about, about how to um, uh, maintain everybody's safety in the gardens, but the work itself is safe. Yeah, I mean, um, look, we, we've had one comment on our social media and I certainly wasn't on, along the lines of how dare you, it was more, I've got some queries. Mm. Um, uh, and we, uh, we answered those queries. We said, look, we've talked to a number of our stakeholders and the overwhelming feedback and and, you know, I will say that one of our own staff was personally affected who lives in the hills. Uh, so we, we talked to a lot of people about this and the overwhelming feedback was the community understand the difference between an out of control mm -hmm. bushfire and an art installation yeah. that uses candlelight shadow and music. Uh, they're very different things. Yeah. And I think that's the reason why we've only had one thing on our Facebook page. And uh, we responded to her particular questions and she wrote back and said, great, I'm off to buy my kids some tickets. And so yeah. we haven't had, um, I guess, the kind of criticism that we thought was possible. Uh, in terms of the, the safety of the event, we're doing it in partnership with the Botanic Gardens, uh, as well as with Arts Projects Australia, who run WOMAD and who have worked with the company twice before. Uh, CFS uh, have been in, in constant uh, uh, dialogue with us. They're really comfortable with Carabos because they've worked with them twice yes. before. The same people, in fact, at CFS have worked with Carabos. So there's an existing relationship that everyone feels really comfortable about. If the Botanic Gardens, are, uh, obviously they are the experts on the gardens and that's why we partner with them because they bring that expertise to the table and we are taking all advice and guidance from them about where the installation is situated, how it's placed, 
how it plays out. And so if uh, there's any, at the moment they are saying, we are really comfortable that there's not going to be any danger to either the wildlife or to uh, the gardeners themselves. And so using that as, as our, our, our best guide is to our partnership. We've also pledged uh, any uh, projected profits um, uh, uh, which go to um, uh, bushfire relief and, uh, and the RSPCA fund. Uh, and we're doing a massive collection uh, at the opening Tim Minchin concert. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Martin. Just a quick question. I'm, I'm not sure whether the administration can answer this. Where are we in the three year funding program? Is this the final year or second year? Or the... Yeah, I'll just. Sorry, can you hit that? Your microphone. Oh, just one second. Sorry, sorry, through the chair. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, Sorry, through the chair. This is the first year we used that three-year funding agreement. Um, the total value of the funding is $960,000 over the three years. So Rachel was right, $320,000 year for the next three years. And have you made a formal request of council to increase that fund? Oh, uh, obviously we did when we put our proposal through. Uh, we thought that we asked for an increase that we'd hope to maintain, but in fact, we received a decrease. Uh, we do have $20,000, which was a special uh, allocation given, I think, for a special council report for the dog's house. And, uh, and specifically, how much are you looking for each financial year for the remaining two years? More well, than 320. Uh, well, yes, but um, we understood that the three-year term is fairly fixed and the only opportunity for us to come back would be through special projects, but we can take advice from the staff if, in fact, it's possible to have an intervention into year two and three of the, of the contract. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or feedback? Okay, Rachel and Neil, thank you. And fantastic job and congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll now move to item 4.2, City Data and Insights. And we've got with us Leandro and Megan. So, yeah, and I was just going to say a few words while they're just setting up and getting ready. So, um, you might remember some of the research and data and insights that Megan shared with you back in July last year as we started to discuss our strategic plan. Um, we've asked Megan and Leandro to come back tonight to continue to share um, the research data and the evidence that we use as an organisation uh, to underpin our advice to you. Um, we have some really rich um, trend data that we've collected over time. Um, so, for example, we've been tracking our city users to understand the demographic, attitudinal and behavioural profile of the people who come into the city. And so Megan will run you through a quick interactive exercise to check that you've all read your papers tonight. Um, and then we hand over to Leandro. So Leandro um, developed our award-winning um, economic insights dashboard back in 2017, um, and he'll show you how to access uh, that site and um, showcase uh, some of the examples um, that have been used over the um, last couple of years. Um, we've also been developing a range of online tools. Um, so, for example, we now have our own data dashboard um, internally, which helps us track um, the performance um, of much of what we do. Um, and we've also um, spent a lot of time the last few years supporting things like um, open data exercises with state government to um, share the data that we do have in a format that people can use and play with. Um, so over to you, Megan, to kick, kick us off. Thank you, Claire. Um, so as Claire's indicated, we're going to take the first few minutes to do a bit of an exercise about um, data. Uh, it's not a test. It doesn't matter whether you get the answers right or wrong. It's simply a way of exploring a little bit about the breadth of data that we have available to inform decision making. So if you don't mind, please leave your chairs and have a look at the posters that are around the room. There's four over there that have a name, they have a little description about themselves, and then they have a question with multiple choice answers. And there's the other two are over there. The answers are 
um, to, if you want to answer the questions, then you use it through the Poll Everywhere tool, which I understand you're all familiar with, so I hope I'm correct on that. Um, but we are here to help you if you would like to. Otherwise, just have a think about what you think the answer might be, or in some cases, what the data source behind the information might be. Members, clock's ticking. <laughs> Another 30 seconds, please. If we can please make our way to our seats and Megan will uh, walk us through the results and let us know how good or otherwise we are. <laughs> thank you. We're really sorry to say I'm not planning to do that at all. Oh, no. um, <laughs> but I would like to thank you for participating in the exercise. Like I said, it was just about giving an idea of the kinds of range of data that we have available for decision making. Now, I absolutely promise you that all of the answers are found in the presentation. We're going to go through from here on in and in the material that was provided to you at the end of the session. And there be penalties for those who got the answers wrong? <laughs> well, I... Is there a winner? Maybe. Should there be? <laughs> I don't think so. It's not intended to be a test. It's supposed to be um, engaging. So... Um, I would say there's, there's actually quite a lot of data. It's not working, Michael. No, it is working. It's just me. I'll leave it on that one then. There's um, there's quite a lot of data included in what's coming up next, and I won't talk to all of the data points on there. So if there's something that you're particularly interested or curious about, please just ask questions as we go through. I think the first thing to say is that we have a lot of data available to us. And I'm going to mention a few of those sources, but really it's very few compared to the total um, array of material that we might have at different times. Um, we have national data sets like the five yearly um, census of population housing done by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. 
That's one of the most important data sets for local government. It's widely used and it's very well respected. Um, we also have data that we generate ourselves, like our city user profile survey that Claire mentioned before, and also a new piece of work, the residence survey. I'll say more about both of those in a bit. And then there's subscription services um, that council pays for, like SpendMap, which tells us about spending activity in the city. And there are many consultancy companies and research institutions that put reports out on different topics from time to time, and they're all part of the evidence base that we have to draw on. One of the data sets that we produce ourselves annually is our city user profile. And that's our really our main source of data about people coming to the city. The main purpose of CUP, as we call it, is to find out what people do in the city, how often, the basics of who they are, where they came from, and how they got here that day. What I'll show you now is if, if CUP was 100 people, this is what they might look like. So what we can see from this is they're more likely to be female than male. They're here to work more than any other purpose on any given day. They tend to be in the city for any reason at all, at least once a week, 69 out of 100 would be in that category. They're equally likely to be in the youngest age range of 18 to 24 than in the older of 65 and over. And they come here for other reasons like dining and entertainment. So what's not on this slide, in a bit more detail, is that besides working, the main reasons to come to the city are to shop, to study, or for dining and entertainment. In the 2019 CUP survey, 28% of respondents, because we asked people what their main reason is to be in the city, and then we asked them what else they're going to do there while they're in the city that day, 28% of respondents said they weren't going to do anything other than their main activity. That was quite a jump from the year before. It was noticeably larger proportion. And the thing I personally find interesting is that city workers are the ones most likely to say they're not going to do anything other than work that day. So I think this data is useful for decision making because we can use it to form our policy responses. Are we okay with workers doing nothing else? If we are, perhaps there's nothing to be done. Or what can we do to encourage them to stay on after work or to come back at other times and enjoy what else the city has to offer? Moving on to people, we've got some great sources of data on people and the uh, census of population and housing done by the ABS every five years really is a key, a key data source. It's well established, we can compare ourselves with other places around the country and because it's such a, a well respected and long lived data source, we can compare ourselves with others and with ourselves over time. There's a new source of data that we also have now, which is a resident survey, which we did for the first time last year. It was done to fill some of the data gaps and to help us position ourselves really well for some advocacy work that we've got coming up. It covered a range of topics and we're enormously grateful to the 815 people who took the time to complete the survey for us last year. It was no mean feat. It covered topics like physical activity, nutrition and sleep access and inclusion. We asked people what they valued most about their local community and about living in the city. It covered preparedness for emergency, safety, and the performance and importance to the respondent for a range of council services. We'll talk about ABS first. So in the top left-hand corner is the data showing where residents of the city are born. And what we can see is that in 2016, which is the last time the national census was conducted, 13% of the residents of the city of Adelaide were born in China, much higher proportion than Australia-wide. But if we look over time, as we can do with census data, we also know that in 2011, it was 8.4%, and 10 years before, in 2001, it was less than 1%. So it's quite a change in a 15-year period of time. One of the insights that we get from data such as this, place of birth, is that where people come from has some influence over the services and facilities that we might offer in our city. It may influence how we communicate with our residents and how we engage them in decision making. And also we have the opportunity to harness the competitive advantage of cultural diversity to attract others to come and visit here and live and work and invest. 
On the right hand side of the screen is some health and fitness data, and this has come from the new resident survey. Wellbeing's been a bit of a hot topic for a while now, and this data can help us focus the effort where it's most needed. So we can see on this, at, in the first category, are our residents active every day? We can see that most of our residents are not getting the recommended amount of physical activity. If they're young-ish, 18 to 39, they're the least likely to be suitably active. And if they're 55 and older, they're the most likely to be suitably active, but they're still well below, you know, what you might desire. <laughs> What data like this tells us is that there's action to be taken if we think this isn't good enough. And we can use this data as a baseline for measuring any activity that we might take in the space as well. I'm really having trouble with this. Moving on to the economy, so there's quite a, a few data sources available to us about the economy. One of them is the Economic Insights Dashboard, which is our own creation, brings together data from a range of sources. Um, spend map. We use a subscription called Economy ID. That's where we get a gross regional product figure from, and that's one of the measures in the current strategic plan. And we also use that tool to get a, a bit of a handle on the relative health of different industry sectors in the city. So this slide is just something really brief about um, international visitation and international education. So you see on the left hand side, there's your answer to the number to which um, Weiwei was one of in 2019 from the pictures around the room. Um, I've included this because we can see that international education was South Australia's number one export injecting $1.92 billion into the economy, and that was up about 16% on the previous year. International enrolments have increased by 55% since 2012, and China is our biggest source market for international student enrolments. China's also our biggest source market for international visitors. The things to consider from this is, with the events going on in the world, how does that affect our tourism data into the future? We might expect to see numbers to fall. That would not be unreasonable. So what can we do to encourage visitation from other places as well? And how can we continually improve the international student experience so that we can maintain Adelaide's reputation as a place of study? We'll go over to Spend Next. So this data comes from SpendMap, which is a tool that we currently subscribe to. So SpendMap uses banking transaction data and does some manipulation to it to, um, to expand it to the big picture. And it, what it, it does is it gives you a, a, quite a detailed idea about what's been the spending spread in the city. So the data up here is the total spending in the city in the year of August 2019, and it was $4.58 billion. Most of that was spent by visitors to the city. I have to say that resident, when it says resident spending in the city, resident is technically residents and local businesses in an LTA. Um, so as of, those are just numbers up there, but as a proportion, residents of, of resident and local business spending in the city, about 31% of what was spent in that period of time was within our local government area, about 40% was outside of it, and the rest was on the line. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to spending the city and growing the city economy, this can, knowing the spread of spend in the city can help us to think about everything from how we build relationships to customers to keeping them, to keep them coming back, whether that's in store or online. It gives us the understanding of what we spent where, although it doesn't tell us why. How can we get more spend to occur by residents within the city in which they live? And how can we gear businesses to profit from the online economy if that's part of their role? For cultural data, Peak Bodies and Annual Reports are really good sources of information because we're often looking for attendance estimates and we're looking for economic impact information. You quite often find that in reports of that type. ABS is also useful too, but it's generally more so for giving us context 
tell us about South Australia and Australia rather than our local area. So the right hand side of this slide is the economic impact of um, festivals. It keeps growing year on year and it demonstrates the importance of festivals to the economy. That we should say that's the 11 festivals, our local festivals from 2018. We're nearly there. The attendance is dollar. Um, is an interesting one. It fluctuates a bit um, year by year. So on the bottom left hand corner is the information about on-site visitations to some of the major institutions in 2018-19. It's interesting because it, it tells us something about where people are choosing to spend their leisure time and the kinds of things that they're interested in and might like to engage with more or less. And in the top right hand corner, we can see that live music is a strong economic contributor and we can say key to the nighttime economy as well. Most live music occurs, that occurs in South Australia occurs in the suburb of Adelaide. So some of the challenges might include balancing the expectations of venues, of patrons and of residents in our city. When it comes to the environment, a lot of the data sources you sit here are things that the City of Adelaide generates itself. Um, rainfall and temperature records obviously from the Bureau of Meteorology, but the community and the corporation carbon inventories are um, compiled internally from a range of sources. And the waste audits are commissioned, uh, are commissioned so that we can understand um, what our residents are, are doing in terms of waste disposal. So in the top right hand corner, we can see that we're actually doing pretty well although there's no comparison there. Um, what the waste order data shows us is that 53% of the waste that was collected was in the, either in the green waste bin or in um, the recycling bins provided. And, but the 40% of waste wasn't and that went to landfill. But the real key in this information is that 61% of what went to landfill didn't have to do so. So that tells us that there's probably quite a lot of room to do something more about education programs. <laughs> and the weather data, well, as we saw with Jenny around the room and her concern about coming here for the festival, she's right to be worried. In 2019, 38 days over 35 degrees. The 2030 predict projection for the year 2030 was 27 days. I think what we can see here is that we can use this data and a whole range of data to understand what's going on and we can make sure or help to make sure the city is a place that people choose to be. I'm going to hand over to Leandro to talk a bit about the Economic Insights Dashboard. All right, thank you, Mia. I will try not to talk about more data because I know you will get bored. I think you have heard a lot already. But my objective is to show you more about how you can consume some of this data by yourself. And this is basically a project that started around, around three years ago with the main objective of provide information to businesses, investors, startups, entrepreneurs about how the city was performing. So the questions that we went through when we were thinking about what type of data we would have up there was more around what would a business would like to know about the city. And that's why we landed on those probably six key topics uh, around businesses and that is more around where businesses are located and what is the business mix in different main streets across the city. In terms of demographics, looking at as Mia showed before, who is living in Adelaide and who is coming also to, to Adelaide. In terms of the economy, a different set of indicators looking, at, looking about the performance of, overall performance of the economy, not only in Adelaide, but also in the region, because we know that the city of Adelaide uh, is the center of the state. So it has, a, a, it, whatever happens in the region has an impact mm -hmm. also in the city employment, property, and tourism. I will just show you one or two examples so you get an idea of how to navigate the dashboard, but I will invite you to uh, dive into it after. 
And you'll see that some of the data sources that we have chosen, the data is not updated as regularly as we would like it to be updated. So, but we had to, um, to pick the data sources that were more reliable. And that's why in some cases we were not able to use probably the data that we know is more up to date, but it's actually probably not as accurate as we would like to. So I will just very quickly show you an example around demographics. And you will have different types that you can tap into, but for example, the population overview, here you will very quickly can have a look at what's the current population of the city, Greater Adelaide and South Australia, the projection, projections in terms of population growth for the next 20 years or 15 years in this case, but also the trend of growth over the last few years and how the city of Adelaide in terms of population has been increasing at a higher rate than the rest of the state. And then some numbers around the um, forecast of growth for dwellings, households and population again. So this is just a brief example. I will jump again to the main page and we show you one around property um, just because it has been updated res recently. So it's probably useful in terms of residential market, for example. Here we have data from CoreLogic and here we, we can show but by January, this was the vacancy rate in city in terms of residential, uh, the, the residential market. We can see house median sale price and unit median sale price in the city and how it has been changing and fluctuating over the last, in this case, probably five years. And, and in terms of vacancy rates, I think it's quite interesting to look at this chart and see how Probably around 10 years ago, the rates were quite low. They, they went up a bit, but now we're getting back to that lower level around 2 or 3%. But it's, it's probably a healthy market. So this is one of the things that a uh, property investor would look, at, would, would look into because they are quite keen to have this type of insights. So this is just an example of how this um, and how we thought about this dashboard. And we have had really good feedback from businesses. We had one example, Provision Liquor, the gene distillery. And they, they actually use this as a data source to look at the market, some market research that they conducted in the city, looking at where would be the best place for them to locate their business. We have had really good feedback, very good feedback from property. Uh, consultants, uh, JLL, Colliers, they have been using this as a tool as well because it's, it's probably a, a good way to bring a lot of different data sources together in, in one framework and it makes easy, make it easy to, to digest the data. Um, the other, and I, I want to I wanna show you a sneak peek of some additions that we are now going to have in the next few weeks on the dashboard. And this is probably the one that we are more excited about and this is also related to a project called Smart CDB and it stands for Smart City Business Database and this will allow us to look at businesses across the city in almost real time. The objective is for us to keep this as updated as we can and we, we are already thinking of, of different processes that we can put in place to make this happen and one but the beauty of this is almost is, is around the tool that we have developed that allows us to actually update this information actually out on the streets. So we will be able to do it through an app and this is something that we will be able to work with you as well together and with precinct groups and this will keep all this data updated very regularly. I will show you just one example. For example, this is about hot street. So very quickly we can see what's the business making, mix in hot street we can see the different type of businesses and we can also see the vacancy rate that at this moment based on this data is around 16 percent. So looking at the colors we can see very quickly that the yellow ones are vacant spaces. So this is a project that this is um, work in progress but in the next few weeks you will already have access to this and this is also something that the whole community will have access. So it's a quite a powerful tool for decision making and again when we decide how to build these reports it's based on questions. So that's why I think it's very important for all of you to start thinking about what are the questions that you have and that you would like to have responded so then we can work around that and probably build 
some of the visualization in particular for you to answer your own questions. I will also show you this one, and this is um, based on one of the data sources that uh, Megan mentioned before. This is spend on data, and this is data about expenditure in the city. This is a very valuable tool, not only because it, you can slice the data by ally and not ally, so you can have a, probably a very good look at those two different servers, but also because this is not model data, this is actual data on expenditure. So this is very powerful in the sense that we can actually see by the, by the day how much money was spent in the city. I will show you just very quickly one example would be, okay, how much have residents of North Ally spent during work hours over the last few years? And we actually can slice it by categories of, of expenditure. <coughs> so if you can see this green line here, that's 2018. The blue line is the current year. So very quickly, we can see that there has been a decline in expenditure. Sorry, um, an increase in this case in expenditure. Now, if we go into non-work hours, actually almost the opposite. And if we look at December 2018 against December 2017, we can see that 28, 2018 was very low in comparison. So this is just one example of how you can look at data. We actually uh, did another example a while ago looking at the um, start of the Tour Down Under in North Adelaide last year. And we actually noticed that there was a positive impact, but especially on the, the, in the hospitality industry. But it, it didn't feel the same for the other type of businesses. So it was just focused more on coffee shops, restaurants. They actually felt a very positive impact, but not, it, it wasn't felt the same across the, all, all the different sectors. Um, and we actually were not able to identify the exact number just because at that same day there was a cricket match in the all. And because we can't drill down into the detail, into the data more than just the server level, we were not able to isolate the impact from the cricket match. But at least we got a sense based on also some anecdotal information that we got from the LA Oval that the impact was positive. So this is just an example of one example of how we can start using this data for decision making. I will stop there because I know that um, you will also have your own questions around this data once you start playing around with it. And that's probably one of the recommendations that I would make because once you start playing around with the data, you start having more questions. And after playing around a bit with it, you probably get to the gist of it. You actually go to get the, to the juicy questions that you will be able to actually make a very good and informed decision around that. So thank you. I will hand it over to Megan once to make any other comments. So thank you, Leon. Very juicy. Thank you, Leandro. <laughs> um, I'll go to Councillor Martin first. Yeah, thank you. Look, um, in previous reports, uh, which used to be called Census of Land Use and Employment and similar, um, we had very detailed information about employment in the city and broken down into Rundle Mall and so forth. Is that information available there as well? So in terms of employment information, the latest data we have for the city is basically from the last land use survey. We, we had an attempt last year to gather some information on employment in the city, but we are not completely happy with the accuracy of data because we, didn't, we were not able to drill down to the level that we actually needed to make it accurate enough. So currently what we are looking at in terms of employment data is all ABS data. And it, there is a bit of a lag in terms of when we get access to that data, but we, we could be doing some some extra research around that. Yeah, that, that's really useful because that actually tells businesses what kind of patronage they might be able to expect from the city workforce. It allows planning on transport and other things. Um, and is that data from the ABS, the data that we've been using? Because I went back and looked at all the reports, and it's 115,250 people 
quite some years. Um, do we know whether that's still the figure you're using or? So that figure is actually from our last land use unemployment survey, and that was conducted in 2016. And we, we haven't been able to update that data. That's why we are relying on proxies of that data. But we actually can see currently, based on ABS data, that number that number has increased. So we, we, we could very easily go, go back and look at that detail. And can you break it down, say, for run the wall as well? I mean, and it was a static number, I know, 10,965 people employed in Rundle Mall. But if shopping trends are changing, as we saw with higher sales online, it would be interesting to know whether that's up or down. Mm -hmm. It will not be comparable to that specific data, but we will be able to compare it against ABS data. So the numbers will be slightly different, but we'll still be able to see the trend if there is a trend there. Yeah. And when will we see that? on the, uh, uh, the site? Well, the site, as, as I was trying to explain before, it has been um, it has been designed in a way that probably that specific question is not answered, but we can easily work on that and build a report that will bring that, uh, that data to life. Yeah. I think that would be really useful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Feedback, Helen? Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, is there a way, I presume that there's additional data that sits behind the existing platform and potentially as other questions arise that can be built in so that everyone can access that, is that right? That's right. Right, yeah, and just, I mean, one thing that pops out is that visitor versus resident, just whether how much of the um, visitor is international versus South Australia, like I mentioned that data would be a useful little filter to be able to apply for it, to it, but I'm sure there'd be lots of other bits and pieces that will pop up as we start to use it. To be honest, this was the objective of this this yes. today, yes. to show you what we are capable of doing, and probably it's only for you to start having these questions. Yes. So we will be very happy to come back in the future and probably workshop this a bit more, mm -hmm. and probably look at what would be the main questions that you would like to have answered, and we could easily work around that and probably build some visuals that will bring that, that those insights to life quite quickly. Great, and you're able to, like you're doing that interface or do we then need to liaise with an external agency to add those metrics in? Or it depends it on how we are presenting the data. I mean, in the way, it, it would be quite easy to start working that, on that internally. Mm -hmm. And probably, it depends on what's the goal. If we want to automate the whole process, because one of the goals of this dashboard as well was to automate the process mm -hmm. of updating the data. And that's why it was an onerous project. And we actually, that's one of the key aspects of the project. And that's why we have won awards because of the automation, automation of the process. But if we don't do it in that way, we still could build a visual very quickly and very easily mm -hmm. internally without the need to go externally. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. No worries. Great. Yes. So I hope that gave you enough of an insight into the type of um, information that we have and what's publicly available. Um, our intent is to try to come to you quarterly over uh, over the year. Um, so what we're keen to understand from tonight, and perhaps you can either you know talk to me, Mark, Ian, or Megan or um, Leandro, um, to, to give us some insights into what it is that you're looking for. Is there anything else that's missing? We had some feedback from Councillor Martin, so that was helpful. Um, so that we can start to build um, some uh, data sets to be able to share with you regularly in the coming months. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. Now, moving on to 4.3. City of Adelaide 2020 to 2024 strategic plan. Yeah. So, Soon. Um, so this is just an update for you. Um, in March, um, you'll be getting a committee report and then that will go through into council for you to make a decision on your strategic plan. Um, so Sue will just take you through where we now arrived. Um, so, you know, worked with you guys from July, 4th of September. We've done two rounds of community engagement. We actually got a lot of good ideas, both from um, council members as well as community, which we're building into the four-year delivery plan, which is currently underway. 
Um, we had some feedback um, on the vision, so um, Sue will talk to that. Um, we have tweaked the structure to again simplify. Um, the plan on the page concept um, did resonate really well with community, so they did find that um, useful and helpful. Um, we're still developing the long form strategic plan, um, which obviously until we've got the short form um, landed, uh, the long form will follow. Um, we're keen to um, get that delivery plan through to you as soon as possible because that will form year one um, of your strategic uh, of your business plan and budget, which obviously we're starting to work with you on next week. Um, so over to you, Sue. So. Sorry, I just my flag. I did ask that that one page was printed off for everyone, so we might just circulate that, um, just so everyone has it in front of them. Sue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Claire. Um, yes, members, this is the latest, I guess, uh, touch base with you around the strategic plan development. As you know, as Claire's mentioned, uh, this process started probably last July, and we we're keen to update you on how things are progressing, um, seek your sort of views, input, questions, um, and uh, use that to inform and prepare for committee um, and then council to consider adoption of the um, short form plan in March. Um, as Claire's pointed out, once that short form plan is agreed, then um, that means we can finalise the longer form, uh, full length version of the strategic plan, which will, as you'd imagine, have a considerable, considerably more context and um, information in it. And um, that will, as Claire said, feed into the business planning and budget processes as we um, undertake delivery planning. So, Hopefully I can make this work. And the live music that was on before seems to have finished, which came on when the meeting was discussing live music stats, quite reasonably. Um, so I'll uh, basically be leading you through um, this revised short form plan and talk to the contents and um, I guess some of the similarities and differences between what you've seen before, Cumberland Council. Sorry, just before we go on, just yes. to clarify, this is the first time I'm getting this one. So this oh, is the short summary of this. Is that right? How do the two documents fit together? Oh, so this, what is one here versus what we've got in here? Uh, both are um, in the pack, so oh, there's one uh, slide. It was provided as a link, but given we boiled most of it down to one page, I thought we should circulate. Yeah, I don't. I did my. I get my my papers hard copy, so I can see the link. So uh, just to clarify, this is the summary of this. Uh, yes, this is the summary um, strategic plan structure of the plan on the page. Okay. So that includes the sort of the key high level elements. Um, the other information you've received in the pack is um, a link to key actions, which then um, help to map out how council can then do that. And the key actions are then on the That's correct, slide. and they're on the later slide. So okay. cool. thank, you. thank you for the question, Councillor. <laughs> And um, yes, just to reiterate, it'd be great to hear any questions at any point or comments because sorry, no man, we are um, here to hear from you as well. Um, and at the end of this presentation, we will have a question for you regarding the vision. Uh, to recap briefly on the journey so far, um, as you'd recall, um, since our uh, conversation started last July, we've gone to the community um, with your draft vision, priorities and outcomes. Um, we engaged with over uh, 1,250 people um, at numerous forums, events and meetings, um, some of which some of you attended. Uh, we received um, over a thousand pieces of feedback and um, had great representation from members of the community, key stakeholders and, and yourselves, so thank you. Um, what we've heard largely during that process, um, well, I think we've had positive responses to Council's development of the next strategic plan, which has been exciting. Um, the feedback we received from the community aligned well with um, the conversations uh, with elected members um, and what we had heard from you as to your common shared themes and priorities. Um, we did also identify a desire to, I guess, um, embolden the plan and increase the emphasis on creativity, which we uh, tried to achieve in order to deliver for this very unique city of ours. Um, 
since consultation on the draft plan is closed, we have then um, considered that feedback received and um, taken that on board, um, whether from yourselves, stakeholders and the community, and asked me today to, to start the conversation about a revised plan. That, as I said, um, places a greater emphasis on the city's creative and dynamic culture. Um, there will be a more detailed analysis of consultation outcomes that we're currently preparing for you, um, which will come out with the report uh, in early, I think it's the 3rd of March, is um, the committee meeting at which you'll receive a, a several page summary of the consultation feedback. Are there any questions on the consultation opportunities? Sorry, and apologies if it's in the report, but I didn't see it. How many responses have you had to date and how many people have been engaged with as part of the consultation? Uh, so um, we've had uh, 300 of the postcards and feedback forms. I don't know if you were aware of the postcards yes, that were used in, yep. in um, stage one of the consultation. So 300 has come back. Yes, oh, that's, that's right. right. Um, and that's postcards and the formal feedback forms. In terms of the formal feedback forms, it's been 32 in stage one and 47 in stage, uh, sorry, 15 in stage two, meaning 47. The postcards were kind of uh, understandably a more popular um, means for people to provide uh, feedback. They were less intensive and demanding of them. Um, and centred around, I guess, more engaging questions around the key themes that have been identified early on. So that would be more high level than the <laughs> yes. structured email feedback. Yep, makes sense. Yep, so we did receive more of those. Sorry. And what about the face to face consultations? Um, we had a number of forums. Uh, when we first met, I think, in this room, um, members uh, pointed out they really wanted us to uh, connect with all of the community, but to focus on some groups that um, had uh, that we don't always hear from. So we were requested to uh, focus on um, youth, young people, uh, creatives, entrepreneurs, and the like. And and we did tailor some of our events to that. So we had while well, we had an open forum and. Um, strategic planning hub at the Adelaide Town Hall Open Day. We also had specific events, including um, an entrepreneurs forum down at the Museum of Discovery on uh, North Terrace. Um, we had a creative forum at St Paul's. Uh, we hosted, um, with the help of some young people through Carplu, hosted here um, a session for young people. Um, and uh, we did make offers of a number of others, as well as, of course, going direct to um, all of our new say mailing lists and um, throughout through social media. And Sorry, so I'm just mindful of time. Um, uh, perhaps we'll just Thank leave you. some of those questions towards the end and then we can incorporate that with our feedback as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, looking now to this document that uh, the chair has kindly asked us to distribute, um, this plan on the page is um, a simplified and streamlined version of uh, the consultation draft plan that uh, was received earlier. It covers um, and includes the vision for the City of Adelaide, um, which we would like to talk to you about at the end of this session in terms of um, looking at two alternative options for a vision. Um, it also um, sets out, sorry, guiding principles to underpin uh, all we do and ensure that it's accessible, innovative, that we're accountable and we always have community benefit driving what we do. Um, it identifies four community outcomes, which is a change from the consultation draft, being thriving communities, strong economies, dynamic city culture and environmental leadership. And that dynamic city culture um, outcome uh, taking into account the um, element of feedback around creativity um, being a, such a core part of our city. Um, under each of those community outcomes, there's a short list in the coloured uh, sections, and they um, are the strategies, um, which are consistent largely with those in the consultation draft, with some streamlining and amalgamation to, to make this really a quite a high level document, given that we'll have a separate long form plan. 
Um, we've also identified five strategic priorities for the next four years and beyond, around the middle of the page. And um, these were priorities that came through particularly strongly from elected membership and also feedback received. Um, and you'll see that um, the excellent governance outcome from the previous draft is now recognised as spanning across all of the outcomes rather than being a separate outcome in its own right. And we've referred to that now as an enabling priority that will allow us as an organisation to show leadership and deliver on your, um, our outcomes with our communities. Is there any questions regarding the structural? Okay, okay. onwards. As discussed a moment ago, um, even though the key actions are no longer included in the plan on the page, we thought it was really important to share those with you so that you can see um, that the, if, while there are presentational differences, the, the things that mattered to council and to the community still matter and are intended to be captured. This work will also come back to you in March um, when you're asked to adopt the plan on the page so that again you have a good line of sight to the key actions that are being proposed to deliver on this strategic vision. So um, the key actions list across this and the next slide will be brought back to Council as said. Thriving Communities sets out those actions Council will undertake to support our healthy, resilient communities to thrive. Um, this now encompasses health, wellbeing, addressing homelessness, connectedness and connectivity, accessibility and inclusion. It incorporates and amalgamates a number of key actions previously found under um, the two other outcomes. The strong economies outcome has undergone a, a change in terms of its key actions. We've added in actions to future proof and ensure sustainability of means in which we move around the city. Um, a new actions also included to expand Adelaide's global reputation as an attractor by virtue of our events, festivals and celebrations. The new dynamic city culture outcome builds further on both protection, preservation and promotion of heritage and our beautiful, surprising places, old and new. It highlights representation of Aboriginal peoples and culture and celebrating in general cultural expression, experiences and participation. And the role of infrastructure in supporting those aims is also represented. In terms of environmental leadership, this remains strongly represented with um, relatively minimal change from the consultation draft plan and the scope still incorporating zero waste, water sustainability, climate readiness and um, carbon neutral and energy efficiency. Excellent governance, as I said, is now um, enabling priorities which uh, will support us to achieve the other four outcomes. Did you have a question, Catherine? Yeah, just, um, um, just about some of the uh, key actions. Is it yes. okay for me to just ask a few questions about some of those? Certainly. Um, just under the environmental leadership, mm -hmm. I guess it's more by way of um, feedback. Mm -hmm. For uh, point zero four, support our community to transition to a low carbon economy through education incentives and so on. That's great, but it is our aim to actually be a carbon neutral economy or a zero carbon economy. So I think for um, consistency, we should probably use that language. So the city's got clear targets about doing that by 2025. Um, and the other one, Heritage 3.03, encourage smart, creative, adaptive reuse of heritage assets. I think that's great, but I think we should also mention heritage protection, given we've got the heritage protection scheme. I just didn't see it mentioned. Uh, um, if you look back to the plan on the page, um, in the dynamic city culture outcome, the last one is protection, oh. preservation and promotion of our unique field, okay. natural and cultural, which is so certainly <coughs> still uh, very much a priority. That's good. And the, the final, and again, it's just by way of feedback, not so much a question. Um, under thriving communities, I know it's encapsulated around developed plans to improve mobility and physical and digital access and connectedness. But I think there's maybe scope to ramp up some of the language around 
access for people with disability. Um, maybe there's a way we could be a bit more explicit about that. It might be on the plan on the page, but yeah. I can see it in the key actions that are for here. Yes, thank you. We have, um, there is a strategy on the plan on the page under thriving communities. The uh, second to bottom is a safe, affordable, accessible, well-connected city for everyone and all transport modes. But it's great to have feedback if that needs to be accentuated. Yeah, and, and just on the parklands also, increased community use of and access to the parklands, absolutely. But I think we should also include in their protection and conservation of the parklands as well. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks a lot. Is that the end of the presentation, Sue, or was uh, there? There is one more step. I might just, I might just, oh, we'll finish this and then we'll take, then we'll take questions and, and feedback. We'll continue with that. Thank you, Chair. Um, we are keen to uh, seek your preferences and level of agreement with um, the original draft vision that was shared in the consultation, which was Adelaide, the most livable city in the world. Um, an alternative has been proposed, which is Adelaide, dynamic, creative and uniquely beautiful. A city in the parklands full of opportunity. And hopefully on your devices, you already have loaded up PolyB um, because that is um, a way in which we're asking you to just indicate uh, how strongly you disagree or agree with either of those two visions. Um, and we'll display live results, again, anonymously. <laughs> so there's no fear. Um, and uh, we're just keen to get a feel for um, the uh, members uh, views on these two questions. Yeah. Sorry, do you find it? Sorry. Yeah, so the third one looks like it's two, it's two yeah. slogans in one. Could yeah. we could we have the city in the park full of opportunity? As one another option, full of opportunity. all feedback is well. We can't vote on it in this forum. <laughs> Hang on, we, so, we can vote or we can't? No, no, we can yeah. well, You can't, can it's not a vote. So we just wanted to test just your level of comfort with the one we went out for consultation and the second one. So, Councillor Sims, if you would like the second one with a different version of the second one, maybe. <laughs> Sorry for your pain. I just no, thought no, the city in the parklands full of opportunity is da -da. quite different to dynamic, creative, and thinking. So perhaps just, you know, think about your preference and then. Hearing what you just said, um, then maybe there's an option um, through the committee or through council that just reworking. I might send you the postcard. You know it's from me. Okay, <laughs> thank you, councillor. All right, go go go. So is this? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does to me. Yeah. Right. Okay. Council, 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 how many votes do we have, Michael? They're not votes. How many preferences have been indicated, Michael? <laughs> All right, move on. If you make a mistake, you can hear responses and try it. Have we all filled it in? Anyone who wants to? Excellent. Okay, moving Thank on. You. We'll open up the floor. If I can have silence, please, we'll continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> we're all keen to get this underway. We've got another big item left. Okay. So opening this up for questions, general feedback. Members, sure. Yeah, we're allowed to give feedback. That is, let's say we don't like this or we like this. Absolutely. Oh, great. Great. Um, but look, can I just say that I endorse entirely uh, what Rob was saying about the parklands. Um, sure, we want to increase community use and access, but our job, as was pointed out at the public meeting last week, is to protect the parklands against large-scale commercial development. So we should have protection in there as well. And uh, for me, uh, and I am taking up the point that uh, Rob tackled, it does seem from the documents that are available that we are stepping back from our endorsement of, in the last strategic plan, uh, uh, the Paris COP21 agreement and our clear intention to become one of the world's first 
well, actually, there's a debate about that, the world's first or one of the world's first carbon neutral cities. In fact, the only mention of carbon neutrality in the whole document is uh, at 4.06 achieve carbon neutral certification the city of Adelaide operations, which is a step back in my view. Um, and um, while we promise on the summary sheet to lead the way in climate action and manage water waste, transport and greening in a sustainable way, um, the key actions uh, seem to me at 4.03 to be a less than serious response where we threaten to educate and support our community to be zero waste, water sensitive, energy efficient and climate ready. Um, it's like getting ready for dinner, you know, the meal comes eventually, but in this case, we seem to be getting ready and not doing anything. Uh, at least that's that's what it's capable of being constructed as. My other concern is that there's no reference whatever in any of the documentation to substantial governance issues. Um, and previous, although um, often ignored, previous strategic plans have given commitments around transparency, uh, around confidentiality and so forth, um, so that there is a level of comfort among ratepayers, constituents generally, that we will apply best practice in governance, not just, you know, a, uh, an undertaking to do decision making based on data and evidence, which is good, which is good. I'm happy about that, um, even though we don't all, always do that. Yeah, um, uh, we could add ideology too, but uh, data and evidence is fine. Um, and I do wonder about um, our commitment to robust financial management when, as an organisation, we are about to enter into very substantial debt for a very long period of time. And to be promising robust financial management, merely robust financial management of a, a fairly unwell financial situation um, would seem to me to be not enough. Uh, you know, I, I think you need to actually provide some assurance, guidance, direction so that people understand how you're going to manage your very substantial uh, financial issues. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, feedback duly noted, and um, we'll work through that as we prepare to come back. Uh, I did want to point out that um, uh, the guiding principle of being accountable, I would imagine, would encompass transparency and openness, um, but I'll take your point. Oh, well, you can be accountable every four years when you go to an election, but during the course of the period, there is a, a, a governance standard that is, um, you know, worth stating, that is to say that uh, the confidential matters will only be confidential because of these factors. Um, you know, there'll be transparency in decision making in these circumstances always. You know, that, that kind of assurance is a, an important thing to include to stakeholders. Excellent. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, in terms of uh, next steps, some of um, what uh, some of the feedback that's been taken on board will it be able to be worked into the plan. Um, we will also be developing um, the delivery plan. Uh, once this is settled, which will set out um, and map out how those um, key actions can be turned to deliver um, the strategic vision for Adelaide. Thank you, sir. Um, Lord Mayor. Can I, oh, sorry, there was just one other thing that I, I meant to ask. speak? Yeah, um, um, ju just going back a little earlier when we were talking about Adelaide being the most livable city, um, given that uh, that title has gone to Vienna, how, do we do, how does that work? I think it's an aspiration, so, to, an aspiration to overturn the current most livable city. Overtake, I think, would be the oh, to be, to be, to be, to be. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yes, sorry. And to that end, it's you know, it's an aspiration to be the world's most livable city. Most livable city, ready. <laughs> um, look, I, I actually agree with Councillor Martin in terms of the environmental oh, leadership. I know, I know. In terms of, um, I think that we can strengthen some of that because we have got very, very clear uh, a plan we've been working on for years and 
Um, and this council has supported just as much as previous councils to make sure that we do get to zero waste, we do look at water, we do look at greening, and um, that we work with our communities to be climate resilient. Um, so that whole thing around adaptation mitigation, I think, needs to be stronger um, so that we have a, a very clear uh, goal within this to be carbon neutral um, as a city. Um, not. I know that we'll get there first in terms of our City of Adelaide operations, but we might get there this year and this plan will go over the next four years. So I think that we can actually um, maybe stretch some of those goals just a little bit. Um, the uh, transparency also, um, I think, you know, as we've been talking um, about this level of government being the most uh, transparent in terms of, you know, how we conduct ourselves. So just in terms, I couldn't find um, community consultation, like how we, how we, because that is, that sort of underpins everything that we do. So, um, you know, in, in terms of there is a responsibility and it's something that we take very seriously that we take everything through the community consultation processes and it's not really there in terms of one of our own open priorities. So if we could add something around that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's been reflected in the key actions uh, about new approaches to engage in the community and decision making, but we're, um, so it's not on the, plan on the page, but um, if we need to emphasize that, that better. Um, um, and if I have made one more, Chair? Um, is that a yes? Is that a yes? Um, and I do actually also, um, I went looking for the Adelaide Central Market, which is listed 3.05 under dynamic city culture, but I'm not sure whether it sits there or under strong economies. And equally, I would put 2.11 under dynamic city culture rather than strong economies. So it's just, I know it's a bit, I guess it's about six, one and a half dozen or that to where it sits, but I would have thought that um, if Adiato O'Connor was sitting under strong economies then the central market redevelopment would sit in the same place. Um, yeah, so, and because I went looking for it and sort of few other things. Thank you. Councillor Sims. Oh, sorry, WCO, did you? No. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair, and well, I agree with the um, comments of the Lord Mayor. The only other thing, I, just while we're going through some of the dynamic city stuff, I couldn't see a big emphasis um, on there around, I mean, it supports cultural expression experiences and participation, but it would be good to beef that up a little bit around, given there is so much diversity in our city, around, you know, really celebrating diversity, maybe something along that level and that's broader than just culture as well that's you know sexuality range of other things which is all about too. how your city should be yeah, yeah yeah so i just think it's it, some of the stuff pieces are there but it's maybe not beefed up as much as it could be so that it's explicit thank you members any further feedback council donovan looks great um it's excellent to see the wellbeing dashboard is in there. I think that's going to be fantastic. Uh, the great to see also completion of the north, south and east, west. I think though at this point in time, I hope we are well beyond that in, in terms of a four year action plan in the sense of the city access strategy and the movement and transport plan. And I see that, that it, it's, this is mentioned in the outcomes in terms of thriving communities, in terms of the, the sort of general, safe, affordable, accessible, well-connected city for everyone in all transport modes, which is good, but I'd like to see it strengthened or, you know, different wording. We've got the North South mentioned in thriving communities. We've got the 0.2.09 under strong economies, work with the state and federal government to future-proof infrastructure, which is important, but what isn't reflected for me is that a key part of the work that's being done at the moment is around ensuring that we actually have the design plan for both cycling, for walking, for public transport, that that integrated connected plan is there. So I'd like to see something in there about within that four year action plan, a, des a completed design around that integrated transport plan that looks at ensuring walkability is highlighted, cyclability is highlighted, as well as public transport as the transport yeah. which is which is underway, but not 
quite some of the wording. Seems to be more explicit, doesn't mm, it? Yeah, not quite there. Mm -hmm. um, Lord Mayor, did you wish to? Oh, no, I was just going to say once we finish our immediate feedback, we can of course feedback in the next week or so. Any other? Can I just get some clarity? When is this going to come through committee and then through council or straight yeah, to council? Yeah, so on the 3rd of March into committee and then the following council. So if you're quick by the end of this week, that would be helpful so that we can um, publish yeah, on the agenda. Excellent, thank you. Members, any further feedback? Councillor oh, Martin. Only Councillor Sims is disappointed that there's no commitment to increase rates as uh, Councillor Moran and I are disappointed there's no commitment to increase. I, I was actually just about to touch on that. My contribution, funnily enough, um, uh, just picking up on what Councillor Sims and Donovan have said, uh, I do think some of the language is a little bit too fluffy. I think that like uh, 2.1, develop ADA at O'Connell Street, I like that, it's clear, it's an action. Um, but then 1.6, support volunteerism. It's just a bit vague, a bit vague, a bit naff. Um, I think, I think, you want to I, don't, I don't know if we want to, I don't know if we want to put targets on there or hard, hard deadlines or, or that sort of thing, but I think the language needs to be a lot more concrete in what we're actually delivering over the, over the four year period. Yeah, um, and the, um, the measures are obviously critically important. So that's where that conversation will happen. We're still keen to come back to you to talk about, well, if you're um, wanting to, you know, volunteerism in the city is important. Are you looking for a 5%, 10%, 20% increase to help guide us and our efforts in the coming years? So that conversation is still to be had with you. Excellent, thank you. Um, and just a couple of other points. To Councillor Martin's point, I would just reiterate under enabling priorities, it could be uh, instead of decision making based on data and evidence, transparent decision making based on data and evidence. Um, uh, furthermore, two other things that, um, or a couple of other things that I picked up on, under strong economies, um, my feedback is that we should have something in there about working to reduce the cost base for doing business in the city of Adelaide. The Under that one, lowest cost. Oh, some, so there's a bit of disconnect between between some of these and that. Um, the key actions I would have reduced cost base as a key action personally. Um, uh, and um, the last one under strong economies, it doesn't look like we've got anything about partnerships there. We're getting very good when it comes to partnerships, whether it's TPG, ADA, O'Connell, um, uh, Central Market, Arcadia Development. I just would have thought partnerships. Uh, certainly, Chair. Thank you. We have uh, an enabling priority around bold leadership and strategic partnerships to meet challenges and take up new opportunities. It was hard to uh, leave that to it. one yeah. outcome, no, so we, we hoped that it would apply across. Yeah. Thank you. Satisfying. Okay. Any other feedback before we finish up? Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now come to item uh, 5.1, exclusion of the public. Um, I might just pass to Ian to remind us about obligations as we come into this um, workshop. Um, thank you, just through the chair. Uh, as we've got an important agenda item to discuss next, which we're requesting to be in conference. It's on the basis that we're in a non binding heads of agreement. Members? Members? On the basis that we're in a non binding heads of agreement at the moment and that uh, we do have non-disclosure agreements that have been signed by ourselves and the proponent. Um, and I'd hate to jeopardise any of those early discussions on the part of rate payers. Thank you, Ian. That being the case, I'll seek a mover and a seconder for this. Councillor Canole, Councillor Abraham Zadeh seconding. Councillor Noel, do you wish to speak? Councillor Abraham Zadeh. Yeah, so. Members, Councillor Martin. Um, I, again, I don't see any reason why this is in confidence. Um, there is sufficient speculation in the media for this to be an open discussion. Um, I might just ask, given that Ian touched on the non-disclosure agreement that was signed, if perhaps Ian or Rudy could give some uh, well, further advice well, on well, that. Well, there's some speculation in the media from, from my perspective. Um, I'm, employed, I'm employed under an employment contract and I'm bound by the, the Code of Conduct for Employees in the City of Adelaide, so media speculation is just that. Um, it's not something that's come from staff, either myself or Tom or others who are involved in this project. So small town, obviously, speculation, speculation, but from our perspective, we haven't released any information around proponents on this project. 
uh, and nor do we intend to until we get to a development agreement point, which would be consistent with the practice under the Central Market Arcade project. Thank you. If I could just ask Rudy if you could just elaborate on whether the um, appearance of bits and pieces of this in the media absolve us of our uh, need for confidence here. Sure. Uh, through the Chair, uh, whether or not particular information is shared in the media is totally irrelevant to uh, the requirement to assess the uh, potential confidential uh, grounds and basis that we're applying for this motion. So uh, members have to turn their mind uh, when considering a uh, motion to move into confidence whether there are sufficient grounds and basis to do so. Uh, that means you've got to justify the grounds available under the legislation. Um, if it is recommended to do so, you of course turn your mind to the fact whether that's, that's warranted or not. The administration is putting forward a recommendation to that effect. Uh, that of course still entitles you to have a different view, but um, it needs to be pointed out that there are serious uh, legal and contractual ramifications if you were to be in breach of those uh, contractual uh, obligations that we've got and that we, that we clearly pointed out to you as well in the recommendation. And sorry, Rudy, if I could also just ask you to elaborate the non-disclosure agreement. Now, I as a councillor haven't signed that, but the city has signed it. Does that then expand to us as well as councillors? Uh, through the chair, the non-disclosure agreement is binding on the corporation of the city of Adelaide that is um, not connected to the resolution to be made by the council tonight. So the council can completely ignore the agreement it entered into. Now, in saying so, that would, um, of course, go without any significant legal and uh, commercial and uh, litigation risk. Um, so yes, you can move to discuss everything in public, um, but th there will be consequences for that. And these consequences will be ultimately adverse to the community who will um, be hit in, in the council's pocket, really, which is great. Right, right. <coughs> huh? Thank you. Councillor oh, Simms, do you still wish to... Yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor Martin, sorry, Robert had his hand up first. Thanks. Um, look, I, I usually do agree with uh, Councillor Martin in terms of keeping or trying to move away from confidentiality. In this instance, however, um, I do think the confidentiality is warranted um, because this is clearly a commercial incompetence matter. Um, but I, I would reiterate the view that I've expressed previously, and that is that we should seek to get this information out into um, the public as soon as possible. And I'd impress upon the CEO the importance of exploring that opportunity because I do think the public has a right to know. However, this is um, clearly a matter of uh, commercial incompetence in my view. So on that basis, I, I will um, support the motion. So, yeah. Through you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Can I ask Tom, can you just explain when you anticipate that we can uh, release this information? Through you, presiding member, just to reference what Rudy said in regards to the NDA, the NDA covers both parties in regards to the release of, or even the, the uh, moving through a commercial process. We've been asked by the proponent, and also we asked the proponent to enter into that, which would stop, um, dare I say, information being released in not in a constructive way um, and also prior to actually entering into some form of agreement. We're in a draft uh, arrangement at the minute. We're in a non-binding heads agreement. The proponent is asked because of their intellectual property. And from our perspective, once we get closer to a development agreement, the council has all the information and the facts in front of them. And it's actually agreed to move with the proponent into whatever the next stage would be. Um, that's when we'd be able to start to release information. And then do you, can you give us an estimate of time? Uh, the, in effect for us, a, a drop dead for us is probably looking around before, prior to the 23rd of May, and that is contingent upon uh, information that relates to the state government as the elected members would be aware. Thank you. Councillor Moran. Uh, could I just ask Rudy again, why, just because it's commercial doesn't mean it uh, has to be confidential. Why would the proponent, when he wants us, I would assume he wants us more than we want him, why would he sue us if we discussed what he obviously, a uh, development he obviously supports? There is no um, uh, information in there that's sensitive. 
and they could choose when they come speak to us not to give us any sensitive, but mate, that's way too long. <coughs> We've decided this a long time ago, and it's really embarrassing not to be able to say anything to the people who are actually owning the land and paying for the development. So I don't understand when you say that you hit the hip pocket of the resident and ratepayer, why on earth would these blokes sue us? If they did, we'd break the non-binding. Then you'd go to and pick somebody else. Surely we have got the whip hand here. I think both Rudy and Tom maybe Tom. Oh, well, I did not actually want an illegal opinion yet. Yeah? Uh, it's, yeah. it's a very good question from Councillor Moran. Um, effectively, we've entered into this agreement in, in good faith. We understand this a commercial arrangement. We understand that there's matters of both parties that need to be discussed in confidence so we can get to a point. <laughs> However, what you've got in front of you is not the information that will be presented. The, the proponent himself will be presenting significant significant information which needs to be maintained in confidence so council can consider and feed into that process. Um, so uh, that, that will be done this evening. But I still don't understand. What sorry, what sorry, I had Councillor Martin after you. Oh, well, actually, I've still got the floor, Chair. I still don't understand, just because you say it has to be discussed in confidence, we're not talking about spies or spyware or something like that. We're talking about a, a publicly owned piece of land we're talking to the lucky proponent that got our nod, or the majority nod. What are they going to tell us that Joe Blow ratepayer doesn't deserve to hear? And I don't want to hear it if that's that secret. Through you, presiding member, uh, council has entrusted us to get the best commercial outcomes and the best outcomes for this site. Yeah. And naturally, we need to work with that proponent in at, at this present stage in an element of commercial confidentiality. That will allow council in the fullest of the time to make a decision where the information can be released to the public. But at this present stage, I would be advising council that we one, need to maintain confidentiality. Wouldn't have the light of public opinion shone on this, which would be on our side, enable us to get the best outcome for the public? Because then they would know the aspects that we're arguing about, like height, with setbacks, all those sort of things. Um, why are we hiding it from the public? Wouldn't they be on our side to get Council the Council I think that's more of a rhetorical question. I don't think yeah, Tom right. McCready is able to speak on the public's behalf or make a or political no, judgment. No, 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 that, that I think is more of a political chair, judgment. What would hurt our ability to get the best deal if we had the people behind us? What are we doing that we think that the public won't like? and we can't tell them. It doesn't make any logical sense. The things that we want for the developer to do, I assume that we are assuming that the public want us to get. So therefore, shouldn't we be discussing this in public? So if we've got it wrong, they will tell us. Do you, Presiding Member, just to respond to Councillor Moran's comments? Um, firstly, you will have ample opportunity to present that in public. This is an opportunity for us to work through design elements tonight, and there will be other commercial uh, discussions as well. The, the proponent themselves values their IP. And naturally, they wish to actually discuss this in an, uh, in an environment where they can have a robust debate with the elected members without divulging that IP into the public. However, it will come to a point where that will be divulged and it will come to a point where the, the public are informed of what the outcomes of that is. Um, and that's all I can say in regards to that. Don't you feel Council, that sorry, Councillor Moran, you've already, you've already spoken unless you have further tell question. The public till May. I'm now. We can't tell the public till if May. You're, if you're debating it, you've already spoken. You can only speak once in this motion. I'm still speaking. Sorry. Let's ask some questions. Through you, Presiding Member, I indicated that the latest date for us would be 23rd of May. We would hope to wrap a lot of things up a lot earlier than that. Um, just again, uh, just to understand that date is linked to a state government commitment. Um, however, we wish to bring back a number of iterations back to Council to be able to move this pretty quickly. Councillor Martin, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, a question. If it is financial arrangements we are talking about that are particularly sensitive, I understand that. But the administration is saying to us, this discussion will be about design elements. 
where is the harm in the rate payer being able to see a discussion about design elements and being able to provide feedback? And if this is not to be the occasion, is there no occasion for the rate payer to say, yes, I like that design element or I do not? Or are they simply going to be presented with a done deal? Tom. Yeah. So, so, member, first of all, that's a rule of counsel in regards to determining the outcomes of the discussions that we have. And in regards to the financial question, uh, the reason why design is sort of a question of counsel to come back. You, you asked a series of questions. However, the outcomes of that design certainly relate to whatever the financial outcomes are in regards to yield, in regards to council's return, in regards to the cost. So they're intrinsically linked. Design talks to finance and talks to the commerciality. Members? Councillor Connell? No, so sum up. Sum up. To sum up, absolutely. I mean, uh, from the discussion, I mean, I can appreciate, you know, when you get it out in public, and yes, that's, that's, a, that's certainly a, a, you know, a, a good ambition. The difficulty we have is this is a draft. It's still pliable. And if we <clears throat> were to come a step back from this, uh, from this arrangement, don't forget, uh, these people have put forward proposals and their designs, same as the other proponents, and they are, you know, so if they were, we were to step back, then they would, uh, they would be in the open. That means that their particular uh, IP would be, uh, you know, open for others to uh, adopt or interpret. So the purpose here is until we've got it set up, until we've decided how we wish it to uh, look and the, the elements that we do and don't like, then we need to, uh, you know, so they go away our team can uh, actually debate it and, and actually uh, uh, you know, get into the negotiation, which they do an excellent job with, so that they do get for us the best benefit. I mean, that's the whole purpose of all this uh, and keeping it to this level. And when we are ready, and it is something that we can try, and don't forget, we, we made the decision as a council, I mean, with the councillors, that's why we, we've given this, this responsibility, and I'd like to think we're, we're trying to do our best on that regard. You know, when we've made it, and then it's, it's now something certain, then and and we're, the negotiation component is now at a, at a stage where we're no longer uh, uh, you know massaging the options and, and the values when that's all done and then we can take it out to the public because i mean that is why we're here and if there was a public worth to decide it then you should have done a public uh, consultation and they should have uh, come up with their ideas um and then we obviously just uh, have to tick that we box do thank you i put that to the vote those in favor as opposed, it is carried. <clears throat> <clears throat>